Hi, and welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and video show which brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. I'm your host, Fritz Bussemaker, and today I'm delighted and privileged to have a conversation with Lou Zacharilla. Lou, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Fritz. It's an honor to be here. Hey, Lou, uh, allow me to introduce you uh, to the, the audience. Uh, you have had a very successful marketing background, including the award-winning All You Can Be campaign for the U.S. Army. Uh, but you also helped uh, to found the Intelligent Community Movement. You're the co-author of a number of books, including The, the Brain Game, Broadband Economics. Um, you teach uh, at a number of universities and you're on the board of directors of the Metro New York Library Council. So, and that's just uh, scratching the surface of your background. Uh, again, Lou, welcome. Where the, the topic of today is intelligent communities, to some extent, mm -hmm. maybe smart cities. And that's why I want to ask you the very first question. And that is, where did you grow up? What was your own community? Well, thank you again, Fritz. And uh, it's, it's great to be here and to have this conversation. I, I actually grew up in a very, very small village in upstate New York um, named Lyons, which was actually named after Lyon, France. Because okay. the English who were there long ago thought the topography and the drumlins and, and the land itself reminded them of that area in France, which it does. Um, I grew up in a town that where the Dutch and the Germans had come as immigrants uh, in the 1830s and 40s. And then the Italians arrived. My people, my grandparents uh, worked on the railroad, um, found themselves to have the kind of life that was far better than they had in southern Italy. A very typical American experience, I think. Um, and also they wanted me uh, to be successful. So they were willing to sacrifice. It's a familiar story, but you know, when it's, when it's your story, it's very unique. Um, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, lots of cousins with whom I'm still best friends. We still uh, are close to one another, aunts and uncles, grandparents who raised me practically, mentors in the schools, uh, in sports. Uh, the Catholic Church was very strong then. Um, it was really a, a very solid community, a good place to live, to grow, to take refuge, to develop. Unfortunately, uh, a very familiar story, uh, the community did not anticipate what would happen in the post-industrial era. And so I, like many of my colleagues, the ones who had been educated, ones who really loved the village, had to leave. Mm -hmm. In my case, I had to go to New York City to satisfy some of the the, the temperaments that I had uh, developed. And it was a very, very sad day. And I have to tell you, um, I remain close to that village to this day. But one of the things I said to myself as I launched my career in advertising, as you say, I was a copywriter, was someday I'm going to find out what happened. How did that place go from yeah. being a wonderful, almost magical place to one where, you know, in not too short a time, uh, we had drug problems, crime problems. We went from having, I think, two police officers in the entire village to now somewhere up around 15 or 20. Most of the spending is on social services. What the heck happened to that community? And that was kind of a, a search from the heart to begin. And it led me to ultimately developing the Intelligent Community Project. Yeah, so let's tell, uh, tell me more about the Intelligent Community and Intelligent Community Forum. What is it and what is it about? Well, as I said, um, it, it began as a work of, of passion for me personally. I wanted to find out what happened with my uh, hometown. Now, it, just to further my own story, uh, I eventually uh, started my own business. Mm -hmm. I was an entrepreneur and it was in the satellite communications industry. So we really, um, Robert Bell and I, who's one of the other co-founders, like who I think you know, um, we founded a business and we, we understood quite immediately that satellites um, were able to connect the entire world with a broadband signal. Three satellites in geosynchronous orbit, as you know, can connect the entire world. So uh, we started to think, what role does this kind of new connectivity have? And there was fiber, of course, rolling out into the world to economic development. Okay, well, can uh, this be about what, uh, what time frame are we talking about? Well, how many years ago? This is about the, this is the mid 90s. Okay. 
This is the mid 1990s. I started the company uh, in the in the 80s, uh, late 80s. Uh, but then by, you know, by the mid nineties, we had hooked up with another fellow, John Young from Toronto, who was an urban planner. Mm -hmm. And we just, be, we be, he was on our board and we began to kick these ideas around. And, you know, I just started to connect some dots for it. I said, you know, maybe the problem is there isn't the right level of new infrastructure. We had the railroad when I was growing up, yeah. but the new, the new railroad was connectivity. What relationship was there between telecommunications economic growth, communities, social development. And so, frankly, I did what you're doing here today. We brought together the smartest people we could find and started to ask questions and tried to see if there was some way that we could go out and share this information with the world. Because as it turns out, Lions, New York, wasn't the only place having this problem. The post-industrial age was hitting like an atomic bomb. Yeah. On, on, on lives and communities everywhere, particularly the smaller ones. So that was kind of the, um, the genesis of it. We had the first smart city conference in the world in 1995 in Toronto, um, where we brought together economic development people, telecommunications people, people from all these different disciplines who had never mixed or collaborated before. They didn't know what the hell they were doing in that room together. Uh, we kind of lost our shirt on that, on that event, yeah. but it actually demonstrated the importance of broadband. And then, you know, a couple of years later, uh, we wrote a book about it and started our research project, uh, which runs to this day. And, and who knew we would end up, you know, being this, this thing, you know, getting invited to the Nobel Prize and all that stuff, which has just been an amazing journey. So I want to pick up on something you just said. Um, and on the fact that the very first conference in Toronto was a smart city conference. Yeah. Whereas the whole your your own personal search started with a small local town, upstate New York, and isn't that one of the issues uh, we should be thinking about? The fact that uh, when you call it, uh, you see a big smart city movement around the world, so that's making the the cities even more important and making the rural areas even more behind. So is, this, is what you're doing, you're trying to counteract the movement to the cities or is it something else you're trying to do? Well, I mean, if you would ask me consciously, am I trying to counteract it? I, I would probably lie to you and say no, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it doesn't look like that's going to be entirely possible. Obviously, yeah. we want any, I mean, the, the proposition, our theme with the Intelligent Community Forum is we want any place a human being calls home to be a great place to live. I mean, it's that simple. Yeah. yeah. But- when you have projected 70% of the world's population living in urban environments, which by anybody's definition are unsustainable for the most part, and you're depopulating the other part of the human experience, the rural and small places, and, and, and creating the kind of devastation that we see in some of these places, that's like taking out one of your lungs. You can't, I don't think we can live like that. So with regard to the smart city piece of it, if, as we're seeing now, broadband connectivity can be can go everywhere. And the methods that we've developed at the Intelligent Community Forum can apply to local governance, then any place can be revitalized. And that's what we're beginning to see. What's really been exciting about this project, Fritz, is that we're seeing places revive themselves. We're seeing uh, young, you know, Fritz Busmackers and Lou Zacharels return home. Return yeah. to places. I see in Vietnam where we now have a, an intelligent community project in Bindong. Guys are coming back from, from the Sorbonne where they were mm -hmm. working, from other parts of uh, the world because they see possibility at home. To me, that's the exciting piece of this. Now, you have to have technology to start, right? You have to build a railroad. But once okay. you get that in the ground, then what? That's the okay. question. Okay, so what I'm hearing is one doesn't oppose the other. I mean, the whole trend of people moving to the cities, that's still happening. And those cities need to be sustainable, hence a smart city discussion. At the same time, we still have to acknowledge there are people living outside of the cities, and that's where you come in. Exactly. And yeah. um, again, when we talk about outside of cities now, we also are, are, have to enter into the discussion, the revival of the small and mid-sized city. Um, you know, I was... I was on Canadian TV a couple nights ago, 
And they were asking me about this. They said, you know, we were, you guys were predicting a revival of a small and mid-sized city like Hamilton, Ontario, Winnipeg in Canada. I said, yeah, I think that's where the action is. The Eindhoven's of the world yeah. in Holland, you know, where you've got a small manageable city where the politics aren't so siloed, where mm-hmm. there's not these overwhelming problems that have to be addressed politically and socially and where you have access to a quality of life around it. People are beginning to realize, yeah, that's where the balance has come back in. And, and these are the places where we're starting to see the investment and growth. Okay, now, uh, could you take us along to what the Intelligent Community Forum, which you founded, what, what are your day-to-day activities? What do you do? What do you offer? Sure. I, I just, I want to, before I answer that question yeah. for you, um, I also want to, because you had asked this, establish the difference between smart and intelligent. Yes. You know, we're, we're called the Intelligent Community Forum for a reason. Smart is the technology, right? It's, it's the part of the investment that includes the sensors, the broadband, all that technical stuff, which you know, I, won't, I won't bore you with. That's fine. You have to have that. But that you can't allow that stuff to run you over. It's a tool that serves the human species. And I, I'm not sure we always get that clear. So what we've tried to do with the Intelligent Community Forum is to look for the human values. How to unlock, as, as Al Gore once said, Nobel laureate Al Gore, our former vice president here in the United States, this is the way to unlock human intelligence, which is an endless natural resource. It doesn't pollute the air. It doesn't dirty the water. And we have a lot of it right, right here. Yeah. We want, and we only use about 3 or 4% of it, depending on whose yeah. studies you read. Our question is, how do you create a community that is cohesive? and is constantly unlocking human intelligence to do all of the great things you know, that, that we know can get done in the world. So every activity uh, to, with the Intelligent Community Forum has that in mind. So to your, to your mm-hmm. question, um, we have a program where each year we take in information from about three or 400 communities. It's part of an awards program where we have we named okay. the Intelligent Community of the Year. But what that really is, is kind of a, a I guess a, it used to be a sneaky way to gather a lot of data, which mm-hmm. you know we needed, and to evaluate where cities are performing well and where they need help. And then we share that information with any other city that wants it. So that's a, that's a, that research piece is a big part of our project. And then we designate communities as intelligent if they perform you know, at, a, at a level against this method. So we've got about 200 cities now out there and they all work together. And so what we do during the year is we have events, conferences, conversations like this um, that that take place in different parts of the world. Uh, We have an accelerator project where we'll go to a place like uh, Vietnam or uh, Jordan or wherever it is and tell them what other people in the world are doing and get them on a path. That's really important because uh, most every place now knows that they have to make some changes. They know that national governments aren't working very well. They know that local governments are where the action is. So they need a path to get on. And we give them that path. Okay. Um, you just made a side comment, which I want to pick up on. Uh, said <laughs> national governments aren't working very well. Uh, it's actually something you've publicly stated before, uh, basically stating the problems are too complex. If that's the case, uh, assume that's true. Um, what's the solution? Where, what are you doing about it? Does that mean we have to uh, um, give up na- uh, nation states and go for city states? Well, city states, by the way, seem to work pretty well. Uh, it's mm-hmm. where the Renaissance was formed. Um, being an Italian, I'm going to take some bragging rights on that because a lot of them were in that part of the world 400 years ago, and have given us 400 years probably of of technological and intellectual dominance. Um, But uh, I mean, you don't have to really be that observant to look around at national leaders, the new emergence of nationalism, and uh, to see that there's a problem with with nation states. They're not functioning as they were designed to. They, they have become overwhelming in people's lives in some places. And the idea that we have in our country of what we call Madisonian democracy, mm-hmm. where, where power is dispersed and moved to the states and the localities, 
where people live their lives, where they can innovate, um, is really, in, to some extent, been diminished. And so what we're trying to do is to say, look, national governments, you know, you do your thing, set the big goals, get us out into space, protect us from, from hostile foreign powers. Okay, you, you certainly do that stuff. But in terms of innovating on democracy, innovating on how we build our lives and our economies back, the real, I think the real player is, is gross domestic local product. And that is driven by things like intelligent communities. So, you know, it's, it's not a, a harsh criticism, I hope, on nation states, because I think, you know, people are, are trying to serve there as well as they can. But the, the problems are complex. And so yet when a problem is complex, as you know, you break it into pieces. So I go to Langley, British Columbia, I'll refer to Canada again. They have a great sustainability project going on. They really understand it. Well, in my view, that's a model for the rest of the world. You can look at that, see what's happening in that laboratory. And then if you want to apply it to national standards, uh, you've got something that's been worked through in a place where people live their lives. So that's kind of what I meant. Um, okay. you know, I, yeah. No, I'm just wondering how often you then get invited by uh, national governments. Uh, I, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And, I, you know, you know, and with few exceptions, and I have to say yeah. Taiwan, for example, yeah. is a great exception. I can go and, and Mrs. Tsai, the president, spoke at our event last February. She was terrific. I mean, yeah, she gets I think it. she's also a former mayor, isn't she? So she gets it. I don't know if she was a former mayor, actually. That's a good question. Yeah, um, look it up. I, but yeah, whatever it was, she gets it. Um, she gets what her mayors are, are, are trying to accomplish. So she has said, you know, going back to the Madisonian democracy notion, mm -hmm. okay, you've got, we've got 14 cities in ICF Taiwan. That's our organization over there. I want you guys to figure out how this, na this island nation becomes an remains an economic powerhouse, mm -hmm. stays democratic, continues to innovate. That's a, she, she kind of gets it. Now I have to say, I go to other places, I'm not gonna name names, mm -hmm. but I'll sit down with a yep. Senator or whomever, and even a prime minister. And I can tell within 15 minutes that I should probably get back on the train because they really don't fundamentally understand what we're talking about. Now, does this also mean that you want uh, to help them uh, as uh, you could say uh, part of the, the governance structure or is the message no, focus on the bigger picture, as you just said, and uh, leave it to the, the local communities? Well, I want to help them any way I can. Okay. I, I mean, they're, they're, they're elected people in most, for the most part, and, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a, enormous control and authority over communities. So, you know, it's kind of like we're looking for the, we're looking to enlighten the ones that want to be enlightened, uh, who okay. really want to know about ideas. And I have to say, for people who get discouraged about politics today, um, if you go to where I go to the cities and meet with the city councils and the university presidents and the mayors, and even as I say, some national governments, you will be inspired. You will, you will realize how dedicated these people are. So yeah, we, we wanna help them, but um, I gotta tell you, Fritz, we, we have to move a little faster on this. True, that's in a lot of areas uh, we see uh, basically, because of the technology uh, offered to the digital technology, the broadband, uh, the whole world is forced to move faster than we had to do in the past. Uh, so we're, we're catching up and it's becoming quite complex. Um, in that sense, um, a couple of last questions, Jeff and Melu. Um, first of all, uh, what, makes, what motivates you to keep on doing this work for the Intelligent Community Forum? Where does your passion come from? Well, I, you know, I've always said, um, it was somebody wrote this about me one time, that I'm a poet trapped inside the body of a businessman. <laughs> um, so I guess passion is always there. I think it's just there naturally. But I honestly, I think what, what motivates me is that we've seen success and I'm beginning to understand what happened to Lions. Okay. And, you know, that... That is a fire that continues to burn. Okay, you've seen success. Can you also, have you also seen failure and what have you learned from those failures? Well, primarily what we learned from failures is that the inability to fully collaborate, to fully understand 
the complexity of the problems and to use the ICF method as more than just a public relations stunt mm -hmm. is going to lead you to success. If you're just using this to have me there or to say, hey, we won some award uh, or look, we've done, we've put some broadband in some fiber over here. Um, you, you're not going to succeed. This okay. is a very, very holistic huh. approach and, and it will take a generation. But to one to, okay, but the, then to some extent, uh, can you then just measure organizations or cities on uh, congruencies? Are they actually walking the talk? And if they don't, well, then they'll never win. It's a great question. No, you, you, anybody who keeps trying, to me, is yeah. a hero, right? Okay. Um, uh, you know, a, a champion. I, they say you know uh, is put up on the people's shoulders, but a hero puts the people on his or her shoulders, and. These places that just keep battling, you know, despite some intractable problems for, that they've had for generations, they keep battling and they have a victory here and a victory there. They're my heroes. They really are because they they understand the stakes. And you know, I'll go to I'll go to the wall for a place like that. And you know, I, I talk about Vietnam now because I've spent some time there, and the Dutch are there. Uh, the Eindhoven International Projects Office folks are there. Um, they just, they just want it. They don't, they don't want anything but to have their people live a great life. And um, I admire that. I, I don't okay. particularly like the political system, but I like the people. Okay. I like, I like the uh, effort. Now we've been talking a lot about communities, the Intelligent Community Forum. Um, I have to ask you, what's your definition of a community in this case? From what context have we been discussing this? Yeah, it, it's a place where like, like-minded tribes gather uh, to build a life, to build a refuge and a place to move forward in the 21st century. And so it can be disparate, diverse people, um, but it is, it, is that, it is that tribe. I, I write up often, Fritz, about um, <clears throat> enlightened tribes versus dark tribes, right? Dark tribes are defensive. It's, it's us against the world. Um, they're reactionary, mm -hmm. but the, the, the enlightened tribes, the tribes of light move out into a world. They, they understand that the world is a very complex, dangerous, evolving place. And yet they have this confidence uh, in their ability and in one another's ability to continue to push forward for future generations. And I think that's, um, you know, that, that's the, Dr. King used to call the beloved community. I think that's the one that should be the model for us going forward. Okay, got that. Two more questions, if I may. Um, how would you describe success from the perspective of when is the intelligent community successful and how does it, what does it would be, uh, mean for you personally? Well, you know, the, the project is much more than me personally, but um, we have, we're actually doing a podcast series now called The Moment of Truth, mm -hmm. where we're asking people in communities and, and people around the world, when did they realize that their community had achieved this, this, levels of, this level of success, that they had gone from just smart, so to speak, to intelligent? And it's interesting because they all have sort of a different definition for it. But each of them say, we now believe that we've created the, the system, the formation. The Dutch call it the triple helix. We've created yes. a new DNA for ourselves that we think is going to last two or three generations. We have done for ourselves, and I'm paraphrasing for them, we have done for ourselves what my father's generation did after the Second World War, and probably your dad's too. We've created a community, a society, that is largely stable, largely peaceful, creates great prosperity, I think values that are to be emulated. And, you know, they've left us with this heritage. These communities now believe they're on the path to something like that. So they've reached their moment of truth. Um, for me personally, um, you know, again, it's, it's, like a, it's like producing a film. I mean, you're on to the next one, right? I think the next idea for me is to go a little deeper into the human psyche in communities and to find out why 
40 million Americans are taking some form of anxiety medication, despite the fact I live in a nation that's awash in wealth uh, and by all means prosperous. Why are we so disturbed? Why are we so angry? Why do we have such mental uh, anguish? Um, you know, what's, what's going on there? It's really affecting our ability to police, our ability to govern. Um, I really want to look into that. So for me, that would be the next, the next step. Okay. And last question, how do you want the world to remember you? <laughs> As a poet trapped inside the body of a businessman whose poetry is expressed today in thriving communities, large and small. Hey, Louis, Louis, I really want to thank you for sharing your insights on what the Intelligent Community Forum is about. Um, I'm getting a message that this, this all started with your own personal observation, how, where you grow up, uh, taking it to the world. And uh, I re really wish the Intelligent Community a lot of success in sharing that message, uh, telling all these communities, cities, both local and regional, hey, that's how we're going to move and uh, uh, get forward. So uh, wish you luck and thanks for your time. Fritz, thank you. And, and please let me commend you. I think the brand called you is just, it's a terrific project. You always do interesting things, honest things, and you're as important to this dialogue as anybody. So it's, it's just always great to catch up to you. Thanks for having me. Hey. Thank you. Have a great day. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.